One thing that I was wondering about was at MindFest 2023, yeah. which was the, you know, the opening of the Center of the Future Mind, this one lady there was very much interested in hypnosis. And she kind of freaked me out, actually, if she's listening. It's really weird. One of the things that she wanted to maintain or ask about was, could a machine be hypnotized? And I wonder if that is predictable or if that is explicable on your model. Could Could a conscious Turing machine be hypnotized, do you think? I would say probably. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedekase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today, we have another very special episode related to machine consciousness. I have with me Dr. Lenore, Lenore Blum, and we're going to be talking about a petition going around for AI theorists, researchers, engineers to study consciousness, like know what you're building type stuff. I'm really excited about this. For the regular listener, you know that I've kind of taken a hard fork into machine consciousness, robot ethics, AI safety type stuff, uh, and trying to bring in the philosophy of mind into that field. That's something I like studying is the philosophy of mind. And I realized there are a lot of abstract thinkers thinking about this stuff just on the other side of philosophy in adjacent fields of study. So uh, we're going to be talking about more and more of that. Sorry, but I'm spoon feeding it to you because it's important uh, and it's going to be really fun. So stick around to hear more about machine consciousness and uh, Turing machines, realized Turing machines, all sorts of stuff like that. What is the mind? Before we jump in, I want to thank everyone who's making this podcast happen. Uh, my YouTube members, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, please consider becoming a YouTube member. You can find the link down here somewhere. You can also send a super thanks or a super chat. Uh, that would be great. Help me keep the lights on. Help me find uh, new books to read. And uh, if you don't like that, or if you're watching somewhere else, you can support me on Patreon. The link is in the description. You get all sorts of perks and benefits uh, either on Patreon or YouTube members. Thanks for making this happen. If you guys like public philosophy, if you like like learning cutting edge stuff, me bringing it to you and bringing guests to you, please consider be becoming a Patreon patron or a YouTube member. That's enough commodifying myself. Let's jump in with Dr. Lenore Blum and let's get into theories of machine consciousness. <clears throat> Lenore, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Sounds like fun. Yes, I'm, I'm really excited for it. Uh, before we jump into some of your particular work and uh, um, this thing going around, uh, what is it called? A petition. There we go. Uh, before we do that, I want to hear a little bit about you and introduce you to my audience. Uh, how how'd you get into mathematics and mathematical theories of mind and, and all sorts of good philosophical stuff that we love talking about on the show? Okay, so um, I s became interested in mathematics when I was about 10 years old. Wow. Um, and when I was nine, I dropped out of school. Okay, I call that my first sabbatical. I didn't <laughs> take my next sabbatical for many, many years later, and I'll tell you about that too. Yeah. Um, but after being out of school for a year, I was pretty excited to go back. I had missed a year. I wasn't homeschooled. I was just um, wandering the world, so to speak. I was living in South America with my family. Wow. Um, and when I went back to school, they were um, the first thing cl in class was doing Euclidean algorithm, which is a fancy way of saying long division, but it has lots of ramifications that go 2,000 years old. And I was fascinated with that, and I caught on immediately. And um, after that, mathematics was really my main love. I really was fascinated. Um, I also loved art, too, but mm. math was probably what I was better at than art. And um, I actually found mathematics really beautiful. I remember sitting in a geometry class and sitting in the back of the class. And the reason I sat in the back, I think, was I liked to think. And hmm. I didn't want to sit up front where you had to answer questions. And I remember the professor, the, do the teacher, uh, putting up a theorem on the board and proving the theorem. And I was thinking to myself, how beautiful. This was beautiful. And I know that's the feeling that many mathematicians have, but I was good at it. And at that point, I realized, gee, this is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, later, in retrospect, um, I think I have characteristics of many mathematicians. Um, math is easier than everything else. You know, math doesn't require you to believe what other people are saying. Yeah. You know, um, I found 
uh, you know, philosophy and history and all that, um, you know, very complicated and it had a lot to do with people's opinions, which mm-hmm. you didn't have to um, really believe. And I felt that mathematics was sort of different than that. It was, a, it was you know, above people's opinions, but also it's much easier. So if you're interested in science and biology, you have to memorize a whole lot of things. In mathematics, you don't have to do that. You just know the fundamental ideas of the fundamental theorem or the fundamental axioms, and you prove things from that. You didn't have to memorize anything. Yeah. So for me, uh, math was both simpler, and it didn't... Um, it just made more sense to me. It didn't require other people's opinions. And so I think a lot of, I think the beauty comes first and then the other a part of your personality and aspects. Mm. Um, in fact, I was thinking back, you know, you're a philosopher, a theologian. And in fact, I went to a uh, missionary high school mm. and uh, the, really the, the best class in there was actually a philosophy class. That's where I learned all my best philosophy in the in high school. Wow. But later on, I took a philosophy course as a graduate student with Hilary Putnam. And I also took a math logic course with him. And I remember not being able to understand the word in philosophy, <laughs> but the uh, math, uh, he was giving a Gensen's proof of um, the consistency, consistency of piano arithmetic. It's a very mm-hmm. highfalutin um Inductive uh, um, proof that goes well beyond uh, it's a transcendental proof, um, and thinking that that made perfect sense. So <laughs> that's sort of uh, where I am a little bit. <laughs> that's so, so great. I, you know, we're coming from philosophy and theology, and we're talking about consciousness. And you know, you you guys have a hold on that because you know you guys have been thinking about consciousness for thousands of years. <laughs> We've been thinking about it just you know maybe last century or so. Yeah. So uh, you have, uh, you, you own it, so to speak. That's uh, so awesome. It's so great to, to meet in the middle there, though. Uh, we're coming, coming from different disciplines. And that's, it's incredible that you did with Hillary Putnam. That's, uh, people ask me, who, who would you want to get on the podcast uh, from, from history who, who you can't? And it, my number one is Hillary Putnam. I would love to yeah, get him on. Yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. Yeah. And he, I know him more from his work, almost called Hilbert's Tenth Problem. Mm which um, is a more mathematical. It had to do with, um, if you're interested, it, you know, Hilbert at the turn of the century in 1900 gave a list of, um, I think we have 23 problems that he said would set the stage for mathematics oh, yeah. for the century. Mm-hmm. And one of those was the 10th problem, which um, was solved finally by a Russian mathematician, but really leading up to it were a number of Americans um, Hillary Putman, Martin Davis, and um, uh, Julia Robinson were mm. the people that led up to the final solution. Wow. So anyway, that's another aspect of Hillary. Yeah, that's that's so fantastic. And, and I think we're going to get into um, some of your improvements, some of you taking taking the ball further down the field of uh, mach- machine consciousness, or sorry, uh, Turing Turing yeah. machine consciousness, yeah, and so I'm I'm pretty excited to talk about that as well. Um, what? How did you end up getting into AI stuff? Because your your love for mathematics comes out. I see it here. Um, then how did you get into the more like I guess it is a little bit more subjective. It's not as rigorously proven. You know, it has to do more with opinions. Um, how would you get into AI stuff? Well, uh, to make it less opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> least consciousness. Um, yeah. So it's a windy road. Um, you know, first I really concentrated on mathematics. That's what I, I always saw myself as, a, uh, you know, a research mathematician. Hmm. But, you know, your one's life takes many turns, right? Um, and then uh, for a number of reasons, I went into theoretical computer science, which is a branch of mathematics uh, that has to do with... Um, the implications of resource limitations on computation. So we're interested in what computation is about, what are the limitations of computation mm. and theoretical computer science. So you went, when uh, Turing and Gödel started, you might say they're the founders of theoretical computer science, they were looking at what, what's possibly computable and what's not, what's decidable and what's not. What theoretical computer scientists tend to do is amongst the feasible problems, those that actually can be decided, can be solved, can be computed, they're not at the high up undecidability, 
are, is there a dichotomy, but what's feasible to do and what's not? And that's been a huge, I had a, so limited resources comes to play. And in fact, with our work in uh, machine consciousness, limited resources comes into play in terms of our explanation. So, so let me go a little further. Um, yeah, please. Um, so about in 2009, I was watching Charlie Ray Rose's PBS series on the brain. Hmm. And I started to see how advances in neuroscience actually would allow us to have a scientific study of consciousness. So um, I wasn't an area I was particularly interested in, but I was fascinated that there were huge advances. And that's probably because, you know, in the 90s, the, with the advent of fMRI, when neuroscientists mm. could start to actually look non-invasively in yeah. the brain, they could start to actually look at uh, neural correlates, of, of maybe of consciousness, of learning, of all sorts of things. Um, and as you know, until about the advent of fMRI in the 90s, um, the scientific study of consciousness was really taboo. Um, was, you know, and, and let me give you a, a really good example of who is yeah. my colleague here, and it's my husband, Manuel Blum. Yeah, and uh, he'd been interested in consciousness actually since he was a kid, mm. since he was like uh, in second grade, when his teacher told his mother that, um, you know, she'd be happy if he graduated from high school. Wow. Okay. This, <laughs> and he decided that if he learned more about the brain and consciousness, he could become smarter. So he's mm. been fascinated by this since he's a kid. Wow. Because he wanted to know how he could become smarter, okay? Oh, yeah. So when he was in college, he actually um, joined a neuroscience lab. Uh, this is in late 50s, early 60s. It was McCulloch Pitt's lab. Hmm. And um, he told Warren McCulloch that he wanted, and, and Walter Pitts, that he wanted to study consciousness. And they said to him, no way, this is verboten. You cannot do this. And That's of course, amazing. you can understand that in the 50s and 60s, it would be really hard to really, you know, it was still this thing we didn't really know very much. We knew some, but not very much about that. Yeah. So when I... Um, saw so these programs, I told to Manuel, I told Manuel, hey, there's a big change. Let's start looking at consciousness. And we started reading books. And I think the ones that struck us and or the papers that struck us most was Bernard Barr's um, on the theater of consciousness and mm -hmm. also the neural, uh, the global neurona workspace theory of particularly Stan DeHane, but Shan Zhou and, and others. Um, and their work seemed to us um, to have a kind of a very uh, abstract mathematical flavor. So if we're mm -hmm. going to look at it from our field, which is theoretical computer science, which is mathematics, we want to get something that is uh, fundamental and very simple. And we saw that their theories really lend it, lent themselves to developing a kind of theoretical computer science model. So mm -hmm. that, I think, really changed a lot. And then in 2018, um, we had sabbaticals at Berkeley and, they, and at the Simons Institute, and they had a brain and computation program. And that's when he and I really started working on this uh, seriously together. So Manuel Blum is really uh, my husband, who has uh, been my life partner since we've been together, since I met him when I was 10. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, we met. It is a long story, but we did. And um, we've, uh, you know, we, anyway, we're, this is actually the most fun we're having working together wow. for the past five years uh, on this and working. And, and it's really fun because I don't know if you're in our house, day and night is what we talk about. I know. That's my next question. Do, um, do you guys, okay, so maybe this is hard to quantify, mm -hmm. but um, who do you think has changed? whose mind more? Have you changed his mind on positions more? Or do you think he's maybe pulled you over to his side more throughout your long uh, history together? Well, when I first met him, he was, uh, you know, he's still thinking about the brain. He hmm. had taken, he was a student at MIT, and he was the only person who took a full year course on Freud. And oh, wow. His volumes. And he, everything I would say, he would interpret Freudian. And I, or dreams or everything. And then I yeah. would say, no, 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 no. Um, you know, there's a totally scientific 
plausible explanation for all of this. You don't have yeah. to go into this. And I think that was one thing where I had a big influence on him, mm -hmm. I think. Another thing had to do with with religion and God, but I won't go into that. That's a little bit more controversial. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. 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 When I'm, wow. Yeah. So, but I think lately, I think they are coming, you know, we talk back and forth. We don't always agree on things, but we mm -hmm. somehow come to a kind of, it's a nice dialectic. I think it's a good use of the word dialectic. Yeah. Uh, we come to blows sometimes, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask you about, so there is this, uh, an open letter calling on AI yes. developers, yes. Um, but it, the letter is put out by the AMCS. So I wanted to first get right. a definition of that. So this is the Association for Mathematical Consciousness Science. Can you tell right. us a little bit about this? Uh, what, what is this? Right. This is a great organization, which, um, okay, it's an Association for Mathematical Consciousness Science, and it's uh, about 150 people belong to this. Whoa. It's uh, it's been going on for about five or so years informally, and about two or three years ago, it became incorporated as a, a real association. And it's a group of you know philosophers and scientists who are interested in mathematical uh, aspects or mathematical formulations of consciousness. Now, I know there are a lot of different theories of consciousness out there, and there are a lot of different approaches to mathematics. So amongst us, mm. we don't even have a single, the single thread is mathematical uh, kind of approaches. But uh, my approach with Manuel is through theoretical th computer science, other approaches are through category theory, others approaches are through mathematical physics, other approaches. Are, so there are a lot of different approaches. But what I, I start to see over time is even with our theories and with all the other theories out there, philosophy, psychology, neuroscience, there are some common threads. I mean, there's no doubt they're common, common threads. But anyway, and the other thing is, it was a way to, for this group of people to form community Mm. Um, and it's a really great. I mean, it's every it's open. It's people are really the nicest people I've ever met in part of this group. You know, everybody is very encouraging. Every, and the way I met them is actually, and the way I've met most people in this area. So you know, I started myself getting more interested in 2018. Mm -hmm. 2019 was lockdown. Yeah. Okay. So I wouldn't have a chance to really meet a lot of people. Oh, yeah. After that, I wasn't part of the associations. There's the ASSC, and there are others, and there are lots of things. But um, somehow, somebody told me about these online um, seminars uh, that uh, this group was having, like once a month. And I decided to start listening. They were coming out of Munich. They were coming out of Oxford, you know, places where I had never really been or had colleagues. And I would listen, and, you know, I'm a new, newbie to the field, and every so often I would make a comment, you know, can I say something, you know, from my, this different point of view, you know, I'm saying, like, you know, there's this Templeton thing about these two different fields that are fighting each other, and I say, well, why not, why, it's not one or the other, why not have it as a collaboration, cooperation, mm -hmm. you know, it seemed to me, I'm coming from the outside, and it looked kind of weird, so I would always make comments or ask questions. And after a while, I became very much part of the group. And in fact, mm -hmm. when they incorporated, um, the board asked me if I'd be the inaugural president. They needed somebody. Wow. And then a year later, they had elections. And they elected me. <laughs> so here I am there, which is kind of fun, because now I'm interacting. I have all of these new colleagues, mm. um, most of whom are I must say, a zillion years younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> and we get along so well. And they sort of, we, you know, it's really been fun for me. I, I'm, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor. So I've been used to working with young people. And in sure. fact, my whole life, you know, I've been working with late teenage, you know, when we come in 18, 19, you know, right. and so I, I'm used to this. So these guys, some of them are younger than my grandchildren. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> but, um, anyway, I, uh, I'm part of this group. And, I, you know, I, I probably, I've said, I, you know, this is probably the last year I'll do it because they need new blood in the top. Mm. But anyway, it's a great, a great board, a great group. And so with, um, so we're in consciousness, but, you know, with uh, this um, letter, so uh, several other things that the uh, AMCS runs is they have these online seminars. Now they're doing, we're doing a lot more stuff in purse 
in person. So um, we've had already three conferences, models of, of consciousness conferences. The first one was at Oxford. The second one was online because of uh, COVID. The third one was at Stanford. And the fourth one will be now in September in Oxford again. And oh, that was awesome. a chance to go personally to Oxford because I'm one of the speakers. So that's really nice. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, informal workshops. For example, one that's been going on for a while and I haven't been able to go there is called a cabin workshop. And they you know, have these small workshops in the cabin in Aust Austria in the mountains. Mm. You know, I'd love to go. So maybe next time around I will. But cool. all sorts of activities of smaller groups, um, uh, they're supporting. So particularly when, um, you know, the... Future of Life Institute put out this uh, letter calling for a moratorium about a month ago now, I think. Um, you know, and they've had huge sign numbers of people signing, like 20,000 or so. Yeah, a very, very large number. And, you know, in, in our community, some people are for moratorium, some are not for moratorium. Um, you know, there are different arguments for and against. And, right. But as you know, even people like a Hint, Jeffrey Hinton, who just came out and said he's, he's left Google because he wanted to be able to speak freely about his views on this. And this guy is going through agony, so you can see it. You know, he feels that he created this monster that he doesn't right. know where he's going. And what is he going to do about it? Um, so, I mean, I think that's very striking. And, you know, I've also noticed that... Um, I've seen several good articles in, for example, New York Times and you see comments, which I've been reading the past few days. And the public seems so upset about what's going on. I, I read these articles and they seem really good. And then people are trashing everybody because they're really <laughs> upset. Yeah. And they're upset with the development. They're upset by somebody who's developed the field and now is leaving it. And how come you didn't see that before or whatever? Right. You know, people are just upset about the possibilities. There are a few people who say, oh, this is for, interesting fantastic this is good but i can see so anyway there's a huge concern about in fact whether and what to do about it mm -hmm. and also whether or not these uh programs are conscious whether or not they can be conscious what does that all mean so those are kind of questions around and we we sort of got involved because in fact we think that it is important to real. So our group is kind of smaller. The people working consciousness is, isn't compared to the AI, right? But it's important for the public to understand that we've got to really accelerate uh, the research on consciousness science to understand what's going on, because to better understand what's going on with these machines. So, like you know, just like the uh, people in uh, who wrote the open letter on to pause uh, AI. Um, you know, the increasing power and capabilities of the new AI are far exceeding our ability to understand what's going on, and we better yeah. try to understand it. So I think that's one of our approaches, to try to be constructive and understand what's happening, understand um, whether or not these machines are or can be conscious, what that means, if they're <laughs> conscious. You know, there are views. Uh, uh, Michael Graziano had a, an op-ed, I think, in the Wall Street Journal, which was just very interesting, saying that if these machines don't have, have consciousness, you know, they could be, uh, you know, psychopathic or something like that. Right. And, and, you know, I believe that, you know, having consciousness and having the empathy is kind of critical. But if these <laughs> machines, there's the other part of the question, if these machines are conscious, how do we treat them? Right. They are, you know, so it raises a huge number of questions, which we feel have to be understood, you know, from a perspective of consciousness, uh, science research. And uh, so that's what we're adding. You know, it's, it's part of the thing saying, let's figure out what's happening. Let's figure out, let's try to understand what's going on with these machines. Let's try to understand what should be done about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm hoping that the moratorium people really have a, are not just sitting on their in their chairs, but are really having an active forums constantly when they say this. You know, they're going to have a, a moratorium this summer of activity to try to understand what's happening, what to do about it, not to yeah. just going to stop. 
Okay. That's that. Well, so that's what I've heard. Um, some of the critics have mm -hmm. said, uh, you know, there was something back in the 1950s uh, where they were like, yeah, we're going to take two months over the summer and try and figure out AI. And, and people will point to that and be like, look, that's not enough time. And neither is three months now, um, especially if they're just going to be sitting around twiddling their thumbs. And so uh, mm -hmm. a large part of what I've been doing with my podcast lately, and the, the limited reach that I have is to try and inform at least people in the philosophical theological community, like here's what's going on. Here are some scholars thinking about this stuff. We need to think about this too. And a lot of us have, you know, a lot of preconceived notions about machine functionalism and how robots can't be conscious. So I'm trying to bring people in to say, let's talk about that and get this stuff figured out. Um, so a, a big part of that is, is uh, your work. Susan Schneider uh, sent me uh, this piece and, and brought you up to my attention. And I almost mm -hmm. didn't even read it before I reached out because I was so excited yeah. to, to get you on. Can uh, I would I'd be remiss if we didn't mention her. Um, are you are you what's your association with the Center for the Future Mind? So I'm a member uh, yeah. of that. And Susan is great. So she's one of the people that I've met in the past several years, too. So I didn't know until we started working on this. And that was, again, through uh, the old uh, Twitter. <laughs> the old oh, Twitter yeah. was really fabulous. That's how I kept seeing what, you know, when there were online uh, talks, whether they're workshops, all of this, I got to know a lot of people that way. I'm not, I mean, it stopped having, serving that function, mm. you know, the past year or so. Okay. But uh, again, I met her through this, these kind of networks. Yeah. And that uh, we did give, Manuel and I did give a talk there and so we were on her mailing list and awesome. we were, I was supposed to go to this, um, uh, the meeting that she had, uh, for the center, her center <laughs> opening where you were, yeah. but actually we were teaching a course at that time. And it was kind of hard for me to, we were teaching a small course at Peking university actually. Mm. Um, uh, so I couldn't get there. But yeah. yeah, so I think she's yeah. really fine. I I like her arguments a lot. Um, uh, yeah, she, she's very knowledgeable, very smart. Very, totally. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I, I I'm I'm with you on all that. So we have this. Uh, we have this petition. We we're, we're telling people, hey, yeah. study. You know, you need to study this. Um, you're you're getting it out to AI researchers. I'm trying to get theologians, Christian philosophers, everyone who listens to my podcast as well. So, so let's dive in into consciousness and help some people out. Like what, what is consciousness? Really, really simple question for you. Really easy to, to solve. What, what do you take consciousness to be? Okay. So as you know, there's no uh, consensus on consciousness. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. But a, as I see it, you know, there are several aspects of consciousness. And I don't think, you know, I think people uh, conflate different aspects of it. So there's something that we call conscious awareness. And I think that's often called attention mm -hmm. in the, the community. And then there's more the subjective feeling of consciousness. So these two sort of divide into what, you know, Chalmers calls the easy hard problem, maybe. Um, you know, the kind of gap that's referred to, uh, which I feel is totally insurmountable, is not insurmountable. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm a believer that the brain causes, you know, it, the brain constructs the mind, the brain constructs consciousness. You know, okay. That's, it's a, sometimes I, there. I don't like labels. Sometimes it's called functionalist, but I, I don't like labels. It just pigeonholes you. Sure. Okay. So. Um, Right. So there's the conscious awareness, feeling, the subjective feeling of consciousness. And then there's another that may be attached to this latter one, which I've been thinking about is agency. Hmm. We feel we, you know, we have agency. And that's not always, people use the word agency, but it's not sort of put together with the easy hard problem, except maybe agency is part of the hard problem. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that's how I think, um, but I think those three, if we understand, um, uh, I think those three are very related and I don't think it's, they're necessarily different and that this gap that's, uh, Nagel calls this um, gap is insurmountable as I said. Yeah. 
that we can, we can understand that. And in fact, there's several things that are interesting here. For example, with subjective feelings of consciousness, one, one thing people often bring up is pain. Pain is, is how do you explain pain? And there's a really some really umbrun, there's really good work on pain. But I think what, you know, there's, there is this condition called pain, you know, pain is a feeling. How do we do this? Um, so there is this condition called pain asymbolia, as you hmm. as you might know. And this is a condition where I think um, you know you get bumped at someone might get bumped on their head, and this is, I think it's the insular cortex. I'm not sure exactly um, gets damaged, and somebody with pain asymbolia is very aware of pain, but doesn't suffer from that. And that's a very interesting thing. How could this thing that we're calling such feelings, you know, it's, a, it's the subjective feeling, by doing some physical thing, you know about it, but you don't feel it. Mm -hmm. That, for me, is a really strong argument, yeah. things like that, for the functional, more functional aspects of what we call subjective feelings. Well, I wonder how how do they how do they know about it? So, like, I, um, some people say, well, you know about pain because of direct awareness of it. it it's the feeling of the ouch. It's the phenomenal consciousness experience, the, the qualia. How how, how does someone uh, experiencing? I, I don't know if I can pronounce it. Asymbolia is that right? Pain asymbolia, yeah. Asymbol how how does someone how do they know about the pain um, and yet not feel it? Just like see themselves in a mirror getting hit or something, or? Uh, yeah. So that they they don't feel the suffering of it. And so okay. what happens is if someone is born with children who are born with pain asymbolia don't live very long okay. because um, they even may not be aware of it even. Um, so they play. So some of these children have to have all their teeth removed because they're biting their yeah. legs. And they have to be so, constantly checked for scratches and stuff. I, I've heard right, of this. They break their yeah. legs and they keep on yeah. playing because it doesn't sure. bother them. It, they're not even aware that that's except that their parents have told them over and over and over again but somebody who gets pain as symboli understand you know after they've already uh experienced pain will tend to say that they know that they put their finger on a hot stove and they ha may have some kind of sensation but it may not feel painful what we call yeah. painful so they could actually keep their finger on their stove and not yeah. take it away. They're not going to take it away because it doesn't feel. So I don't want to go into that too much. But for me, sure. that's an example. I think there are more and more examples like that. And I don't think that's a complete explanation. But okay. it's one to ponder, I think. Pain asymbolia is a situation to ponder. Hmm. And in fact, it also, I think what it relates to is, you know, a lot of people say we don't want robots when we build them to suffer. Well, again, these children don't live very long if they if they don't suffer because yeah. they, uh, you know, they don't <laughs> they bite their lips, they break their legs, they you know do all things that they. That, so having that suffering is an aspect of taking care of yourself. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So pain's an indicator of of nerve damage or or nerve yeah of tissue right. damage. So, and so if you I don't have that black and white all of this but sure. I, I don't think it and, and i'm saying it's not black and white i don't think you want to build a, a robot that doesn't suffer at all because okay because then it won't have empathy either for you yeah right? that's true it doesn't yeah. have that so I, I i'm starting to i'm just saying that it's not black and white with a lot of <laughs> yeah characters and that people totally. tend to make black and white right yeah i i, I tend to say that yeah so okay. um yeah, yeah, well, I'd, I'd love to jump in on your, um, what do you call CTM, uh, Conscious right. Turing Machine Model, and that's right. a, uh, a theoretical computer science model, and right. it's it's fun because it you, you also blend in global workspace with yes. uh, yeah. Turing machines. Can you lay that out for us a little bit? Right. So as I mentioned, you know, the global workspace model of uh, BARS, the theater model, seemed to lend itself very much to, to formalizing a model that we wanted. So... So let me just back up a little bit. Um, when Alan Turing designed what we call the Turing machine, mm -hmm. he was interested. Actually, he had a lot of motivations to do that. Um, it wasn't just to understand computation. But um, 
he he wanted to um, you know look at decidability questions. He wanted to look at um, computation of real number. He had a lot of motivations, let's just say. But designing this machine is a very simple machine. Um, and it is as powerful in terms of computation as what the GPTs, uh, what you can compute on you know, in the cloud, whatever you can do. Anything that you compute in the cloud, you can compute on this simple Turing machine. Yeah. It looks nothing like computers. It looks nothing like their algorithms look nothing like the algorithms that GPTs are using, deep learning models, nothing like it. It's very simple. You can program mm -hmm. it very simply. And yet it's powerful. It can do computations. If you can do it on you know, these big machines, you could do it on the Turing machine. Yeah. But, you know, as we can see now, we can't get our heads around GPT, but, you know, large language models. But you certainly can get your head around Turing machines. And yeah. you can prove what's possible, what they can compute and what they can't compute. Okay. Yeah. And so our idea here was to do something we're sort of um, uh, influenced by Turing here is to get a very simple model. The main, we're not modeling the brain. We're just interested in consciousness, modeling consciousness in a very simple model. So that's mm -hmm. where we get. On the other hand, um, our CTM is, is not a, a standard Turing machine because what we're claiming is it's not the input output map of a Turing okay. machine that makes it conscious, it's what's under the hood. And we're saying for our machines, there are several things that are really important under the hood. Yeah. And, it's, um, and one of these is the global workspace. Okay. And um, so, let, so let me tell you what I, I want to say. Okay, I want to say what it's not. It's not a model of the brain. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's not a real Turing machine. Okay. It's not exactly uh, Bars's model either. It has lots okay. of other features, and it's it's both simpler and more interesting. Okay, I'll say it in that. <laughs> um, what else? It's not. I don't know. Those are the three things. Not a Turing machine. It's it's uh, not a model of the brain, and it's not Bars. Okay, but it's influenced by Bars. Okay, so. The way Bars describes consciousness through his theater model is, you know, he has this small, you have a small stage, an actor on this stage who's broadcasting some script to a huge audience, okay, of mm -hmm. intelligent beings in the audience, right? And in his model, those intelligent beings sometimes want to get some information on the stage for the actors to read, to broadcast. Maybe the, someone in the audience has a question and wants to get an answer to that. And the, the, somehow Barr says they talk among themselves and then something gets up on stage and is broadcast down. Okay, so you can think of the audience as our, what we call in our CTM, the long-term memory processors. Those, those are the unconscious processors. They're powerful, there are many of them. And they start off in our machine as being not connected, but there are many of them. We, we say 10 to the seventh, there could be more than that. So we, we just chose 10 to the seventh as the number of cortical columns. In, in the, the, okay. The, and these yeah. are processing information and yet they're, they're processing, not They're, they're not very conscious. powerful. Some of them are special purpose, some are not. Some are just, okay. you know, uh, not, not defined, not developed, but they have potential to develop it, whatever. Yeah. Okay. And every so often they want to get their information on stage. And, and so let me give you the example we always give to, to show you how this sort of works. So you've probably, you may and may not have had this experience. You go to a party and you see somebody you know, but for the life of you, you can't remember their name. Almost every day, yes. Okay. But then you go home and an hour later, the name pops up and then it's too late to do anything about it. Yeah. Okay, so what's going on? So let me explain to you what's going on in terms of our model, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, when you see this person, okay, one of your processors in your long-term memory and your unconscious process is really, really embarrassed, very embarrassed, and sends a message that wins a competition and gets up into short-term memory. What's her name? Mm -hmm. And immediately the actor reads this message, what's her name, and all the members of the audience hear that, or it's broadcast to them, and now they're all aware of the question, what's her name, and mm. you're unconscious. You're not conscious of that. You're only unconscious of, of that one bit of information, what's her name, which gets broadcast down, right? Mm. Because you, you, you say, what's her name? And those processes are starting to work on, on this 
uh, to solve the question. And one processor says, oh, I met her in Florida at the inauguration of, you know, Susan's uh, workshop. Okay, that gets into your, so that little bit comes in and um, that gets broadcast down. And another processor says, oh, I think her name begins with T, goes up there. And then um, another one gets, everybody gets the information and another processor so they puts it all together and says her name is Tina and that's the person you met. Mm. Okay? Yeah. So these things are mostly happening unconsciously. Every so often, one of the conscious unconscious processors is getting a little bit of information into your short-term memory because it's winning. It it's, feels very strongly that that information is correct, and you put yeah. the, it's being put together. So in our CTM, our model is a little bit like that. We have a very tiny stage which we call short-term memory. Okay. And then we have a lot of many, many long-term memory processors, which are unconscious, are unconscious processors. And as I said, these long-term memory processors are very powerful. Some are special purpose. Mm -hmm. And then we have input coming into our machine from the outside world through sensors. Mm -hmm. And the input goes to some of the long-term memory processors. So maybe you have an eye and it's going to your vision processor, okay, information. And then output can go from some processors, maybe from your motor processor to your legs, to your actuator, to do something in the outside world. So yeah. there's input coming into our machine from the outside world. There's output going to the outside world. And then what's happening is um, we have some special processors. So, so let's look at what's her name. This process says what's her name. We have a very um, specialized, so what Barr says, you know, they decide amongst themselves um, how they get their information up into short-term memory. We say um, what the processes are doing is they're putting chunks of information into a competition. So chunks are very small amounts of information um, that we formally define. Um, in a competition to get up into short-term memory and that gets broadcast down. These chunks, uh, our machine has a special language which we call Brainish, okay? Brainish, okay. Brainish, and Brainish is a multimodal language. So the <laughs> internal in the machine is a multimodal language which we call Brainish. And every word in Brainish is a multimodal word. So that, that could be a sense, it could be a vision, it could be a sound, it could be a touch, and that's all uh, succinctly in that one word. So the word is multimodal. So when is it, you have is it only sense? Is is it only sense data, or could it also be? Because um, in on classic like Put uh, Putnamian machine uh, functionalism, uh, an output could also be another internal state, right? So so is well, and ours is not. It's just uh, okay. about it's um, our chunk. Um, so uh, who's the guy who took seven, seven plus or minus two as the amount of information you can con contain in any one moment of time? In our machine. I'm not sure. uh, yeah, you're sending it down. You're trying to broadcast right now. You're trying to get, get right, the rest I, of your I, processors. I will come, to I will come up. It, it will come up. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah. So, our, so we have a very small amount of information, which we call a chunk. Okay. And in the chunk, there is a gist. And the gist is a very succinct description of what's her name, for example, could be a gist. Okay. A very little bit of information, what's her name, gist. But each of these gists, the processor puts a weight to the gist. Okay. Um, how, how important that gist is. So the, pro the, the process is so embarrassed, puts a very, very high weight mm -hmm. on that, that gist, which makes it more likely it's going to win the competition to get mm. into short-term memory. We have a very well-defined competition to get into short-term memory. Okay. Okay. And also the gist, uh, the chunk has a gist inside. It has a weight. It also has a valence because it could be a positive uh, feeling or information or negative information. Would the embarrassment be a negative uh, valence? Could be negative, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the embarrassment could be negative. And on the other hand, the absolute value of the weight is going to, the valence isn't going to matter so much as the weight for this particular thing. And in fact, okay. you're quite right that the, what's what's happening in our machine is the machine itself tries to minimize negativity, mm. tries to get positivity too. So it tries at the same time to get high weighted things into 
short-term memory, but at the same time tries to uh, minimize uh, negativity. And by, by weighting uh, high priority uh, items more strongly, it's a better probability of having a uh, non-negative, a positive uh, overall uh, system because you're not running into these negatives all the time of being embarrassed and such. Yeah, so there's a homeostasis happening a little there bit. There we go. Yeah, kind of yeah that's happening nice. Happening a, a little bit in our system. What's what we like about our what we've done formally is we've taken bars is they discuss amongst themselves what you get up on stage to a formal um, competition, which has a very nice property. So you, you know that if you have a tennis match or a um, chess tournament, they have to seed it because you don't want to have the two top players playing together to start. So right. they balance things out and they have to see what people's ratings are, their rankings are, and, and sort of move them around. But you're not going to be able to, in the machine, move around these processors. So our um, competition has this very nice property. It's in the, the, the probability for a processor getting its information to short-term memory is independent of location of the processor, but has to do with um, you know, the probability it's uh, weight, the, its weight versus everybody else's weight. Interesting. And so it has a higher probability of coming in. So it has, and in fact, another interesting thing of our model is when we try to do the model deterministically without any probability at all, it became very cumbersome. We hmm. had, and a little in this competition tree, we had to add a, a, what we call a coin toss, um, a, a coin toss node that okay. puts a coin to do something. And that actually simplified our whole model. We didn't have to make special cases. And wow. in fact, we get this very nice result is that the processor gets its information into short-term memory independent of this location. So it's mm -hmm. actually a nice competition, possibly for tennis tournaments. <laughs> so you didn't have to move people around. Yeah. So anyway, I'm not going to claim that right yet. But <laughs> so okay, so we have brainish, uh, this very um, rich multimodal language. Um, we have uh, the broadcast mechanism, the global workspace broadcast mechanism. But at first, um, these processes, as I said, we want it to be very simple. You might want to wire some processes together, but we wanted to start with our baby CTM not wired together. All the processes are totally independent. Mm. And so what happens is when one processor asks the question, what's her name? And another processor asks, answers her name is Tina, which is correct. Those processes will form bidirectional links between themselves. So in other words, when processors realize other processors are related or have good information, they will form links between them. So okay. links will form. And so what that does is it turns unconscious, conscious processing to unconscious processing. Conscious processing is when it goes through short-term memory and gets broadcast. That's okay. what we call conscious awareness, when it's yeah. broadcast, conscious awareness. At the beginning, everything is going through short-term memory. All communication between processes is, is conscious communication because it has to go to short-term memory to be broadcast. Yeah. But after a while, links form, and that turns conscious processing into unconscious processing. So in fact, when you learn to ride a bike, right, everything is done consciously. It's going through your conscious, all your movements, all your thinking. But after a while, the links are getting stronger and stronger and it, riding a bike becomes an unconscious. It's done unconsciously through links of your unconscious processes. Those are the audience processes. I wonder if that's what, what uh, people like Michael Pogliani talk about as like tacit knowledge. Where it's it's uh, it's in there, but it's it's tacit. It's not like it's on you and you're up. Yeah, after a while, you might call riding a bike as tacit knowledge, though. It, when you start, it's not tacit at all. Right, right. And okay. in fact, um, Alison Gopnik, who works with uh, infants and babies, says something that sounds very strange to everybody. She says babies and infants are more conscious than adults. Huh. Sounds really weird, but in our model, it's really true. Oh, because yeah. ABCTM, all the communication has to be going through uh, short term memory, it has to get up to the stage, and then it gets broadcast down. As soon as it's broadcast, we say consciously where. So until those links form, yeah. there's 
so if you're conscious of lots of things, you're not going to be sort of focusing too much on stuff. So after a while, you know, those links are forming. In fact, that's one of the reasons we only have a little bit of information at a time in yeah. short -term memory, so you can focus. Yes. Be, if they're too much there, you're not going to know how to focus. Right. And and the baby stuff, the baby being more conscious makes a lot of sense because it doesn't have like these neural ruts maybe or, you know, uh, well-formed neural pathways or uh, they're looking at everything and it's yeah. the first time they're seeing it. You can imagine getting really tired. You can see why a baby would have to sleep all the time, right? But um, that's that's really fascinating. Wow, I never thought of that. And that's why I said our model, even that when she says it, everybody says, how could it be babies be more conscious? But you can understand it in our model. Yeah. And what's nice about our model is we can start to explain things in our model. We make formal definitions. So conscious awareness, is, the formally definition is the reception of all unconscious, all long-term memory processors of the information that was broadcast from the stage. Okay. That's our formal definition of conscious awareness. Yeah. Okay, we have a formal definition. Now we can make lots of formal definitions, but we want to make sure they make sense. So we have huh. to show that they have some explanatory um, properties. So yeah. It's one I just gave you of Allison's, but. Um, yeah, so that's that's a great point to note that like there's some theoretical virtues when you're comparing theories, like simplicity, do they predict what, what we would expect them to predict? Do they explain the phenomena which we're trying to explain? And and so that's a, a great point to note about your, your model. Yeah, that's so that's what we've been doing a lot also is, um, you know, so oftentimes the way people, you know, we understand the brain, for example, is through pathologies. Yeah. Right. You know, when, and so we want to see if our conscious Turing machine can exhibit some pathologies. And yeah. we've gone through a lot of them. We've taken, well, so we started with three of the standard ones that people always use. So for example, if you look at the Haynes book, he has the things about sight. So there's blind sight, there's inattentive uh, blindness, and there's change blindness. Hmm. And, and for example, um, so change, so let's say, let's look at blind sight. So blind sight's a phenomena that um, somebody says, thinks they're blind. They're, they're, con they're convinced they're blind, but you tell them to go down this, my, like my office, which you can't quite see now is really like a obstacle course. And I ask, well, just look <laughs> off that, you know, and they'll be able to do that. Yeah. You know? And what's, so what's going on? What's going on? So we can give a very simple explanation in our model. Our model can, our CTM can experience a blind side. And this is how it could. So suppose we have this CTM, right? And it's been brought up okay. And it has an input from uh, the eye, its eye, it's, that goes right to the vision processor, yeah. okay? And the vision processor, when it sees something, you know, sends a message up to short-term memory, gets broadcast. It also makes a link maybe to uh, the motor processor uh, because the motor processor is going to be able to move once we see things. So, so links are, lots of links are formed or they're strengthened, okay? But suppose at one point the, um, the, the line or the path from this vision processor up to short-term memory is broken. Right. We have an uptree and, it, and the path is broken. So the vision processor sees, you know, that door over there or that bookcase over there, but it can't get the information up to short-term memory mm -hmm. um, because the link's broken. Yeah. But it has a link to the motor processor already because it already was didn't have blind sight early in its life, so it developed this link. And so information then is going right to the motor processor that then goes to the leg and starts moving around. Mm. So it's going through uh, unconscious or those links in the long-term memory processors in our machine. So that's a way our machine at least can uh, experience blind sight. Yeah. That we can just say there's the link to uh, short-term memory is broken, so it never gets its information into short-term memory. It never gets the feeling of consciousness that it could see, but nevertheless, yeah. those links are carrying that. And there is a neuroscience uh, uh, information that corroborates this with the various parts of the brain. I'm not saying this is a very high-level explanation. Sure, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I've heard I've heard of experience experiments like this where um, people who who go blind later in life uh, because of certain uh, circuitry in their brain, uh, uh, you know, some kind of malady, they can guess uh, at like a really high percentage if someone's raising their right hand or their left hand, and it's the same kind of thing that you're talking about. I wonder, do you use the the language of like access consciousness here, or or not really? We don't. I don't know if access consciousness is what we call conscious awareness. But okay. um, but let, let me sort of write. I, 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 maybe access is like conscious awareness, uh, attention. I, mm. I don't know if it's similar. I think okay. they're subtly, they may be subtly different. But now let me get to the feeling of consciousness here yeah. in our machine. Okay. So we start with most processors are undifferentiated. In fact, Manuel would like, not, what we've tried to do in our model is simplify, simplify, simplify. So, for example, bars and many in models have a conductor or a um, executive director. We have no executive director in our model. We have hmm. taken that out. We have not. Okay. It's a distributed model. No exec. In fact, that's why it's good for AGI because there's no executive director here. Yeah. Um, okay. So we we say there are some built-in processors. We do have an inner speech processor. We do have an inner vision processor. We do have an inner sensation processor. And we do have a model of the world processor built in. Now, this doesn't, Manuel claims we can get away with every, we, if we, he's trying to simplify, simplify. We, we don't need this, but let's suppose it's developed enough to have these processors. And we're claiming the model of the world processor is sort of key to the uh, feeling of consciousness, the okay. subjective part. and. Um, so what the model of uh, world processor, it's actually a collection of processors. And um, the collection of processors starts to make models of the external and internal world. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it does this using, and using um, making predictions, getting uh, feedback and, and correcting learning. So I haven't told you a very important thing that's built into all of our long-term memory processors. Yeah. And this is where the third Blum comes in. So this is work of Manuel Blum, Lenore Blum, and the third Blum is Avram Blum. Okay. <laughs> what, what's, what's the third Blum's relation to the other two Blums? Well, he's very related. We've known him since he was born. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> We've known him his whole life. Okay. Okay. So uh, he's a, the, Avram Blum's a machine learning guy. Okay. And we were telling Avram that we have this model of the conscious Turing machine. Now, he's a much more formal machine learning. You know, he sees his parents a little far out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But we say to him, okay, uh, Avram, he actually lives in Chicago. So I think. Oh, watch. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we have this problem that we need to have some kind of learning mechanism in our long term memory processors that when they get feedback, they can adjust what their, their weights that they give the chunks. So for example, suppose one of the processors for what's her name said her name began with a S and her name was Tina. Later on, the processor will get the broadcast that her name was Tina. So that brought the, that processor will find out they were wrong with the, yeah. T, with the S and it's, what Avram calls it sleeping expert algorithm, because think of the long-term memory processes as sleeping experts, Yeah, will say, hey, you were uh, too bold. You gave too much weight to, to your information. It was wrong. Hey, cool it. But maybe another processor said her name started with T, and it didn't get up into short-term memory, even though later we found out her name was Tina. Its processors will say, hey, you were a little too timid. Why don't you increase? You were right, but you were too timid. Why don't you increase the yeah. weight you're giving your, yeah. uh, your chunks? So this is kind of the learning based on the predictions you might think of as uh, the chunks that they're putting into um, the chunks with just that they're putting into the competition for short-term memory as being a kind of prediction or what they're giving information to the outside world through an actuator. Yeah. And feedback is coming either through the broadcast or from the outside world or from other processors. And then the learning is coming from these built-in uh, something experts algorithms, which are telling how to readjust weights. 
when okay. when uh, so so this uh, sleeping uh, the sleeping experts come through and they're telling uh, different uh, nodes to yeah. to change their weights, different chunks, I guess, to change their weights. So they're telling different processes to processors. Change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The chunk contains a lot. Of, it has a little bit of information. The chunk is small. It contains the address of the processor. It yeah. tells. A li the gist of information, very small amount of information. Yeah, it has the weight and it has the valence. Okay, so okay. so when yeah. the sleeping expert comes around and uh, and tells the processors to change their weight, is there a general processor called or that's responsible for starts with S in general, or is it specifically starts with S only in reference to? The question what's her name in this one instance because i can imagine if you change the weight for starts with s that could be a big problem for your for the model if starts with s goes down and your uh your system always needs to um be reasoning with starts with s right if you deal with a lot of people named with s names and you have this generalized well, well, it's you not saying for the specific thing it's saying that if after a while you're making a lot of mistakes that you're giving a lot of weight then the okay. processor will say, hey, you know, you'd, you'd be a little more cautious, use more information when you're giving weights. Uh, okay. And, okay, uh, but is, is there a processor that is, like, dedicated just to starts with S? Or is that no, just like a no, – okay, no. gotcha, gotcha. No, That's no. It's reacting to questions, or if it has okay. the question itself, how do you gotcha. prove the theorem, for example? Yeah. And, cool. in fact, that's how – we're seeing it as an AGI. So let me just, okay. I want to go back to the model of the world, but as we're yeah. seeing it as an AGI, for example, suppose the CTM has a problem it wants to solve, but it doesn't know. So the whole, well, the whole entity we'll call the CTM. Okay. Right? It's the one with the global broadcast system, with the a competition, with the short term memory, long term memory inputs, out, well, the whole system. The whole yeah. system has a question, it has a problem it wants to solve. But the system doesn't know which processors may have the competence to solve it, the interest to solve it, the time to solve it, or whatever. So there's when this whole pro, whole CTM has a problem, it's really because some processor has that problem. I want to prove uh, this theorem, the Riemann hypothesis. Yeah, okay, this is simple proof. It. <laughs> yeah, take a theorem. I want to prove this. Hmm and puts it into sh uh, the competition, gets into short-term memory, it gets broadcast. Now, some processes may be better in mathematics and may be starting to look at this, right? Mm -hmm. And it may give some clue. And then another process, which actually goes to get broadcast, another process in thinking about it does this. And in fact, um, this is, you know, all sorts of things. I want to compose an opera I don't know which of my processors. There's a, one that's really interesting. Processor wants to, the machine, the, the CTM, to compose an opera. It doesn't know which processors it's going to call on yeah. to do that. But it says, hey, let's get together and pro create an opera. So some processors may have the capability, the interest to do it, and it'll start to get clues. And then it'll be broadcast down, and other processes will get involved, and they'll be broadcast. So this is how we see the, this global workspace actually being a good model for AGI. Mm. So we don't have a director there. It's actually going to emerge because they're all getting the information, and the ones that are interested, capable, will be actually uh, working on this. You know, I sort of call this the Poincaré effect. Um, you know, there's a mathematician, Henri Poincaré, and he tells this story. It's a very well-known story of working on some area of mathematics um, day and night, day and night, day and night, you know, and he's not getting anywhere. And he said, luckily, a friend asked him to go on a hiking trip, which he loves. So he takes this bus to go there. And he says, the moment he steps on the bus, the idea pops up into his mind that these two theories that he'd been thinking about a lot, that they didn't see are connected, they're isomorphic theories. Hmm. Okay, they just popped into his head. Well, of course, what's happening, he has a lot of that information in different processors because he's been thinking about it, working on this problem day and night, maybe not yeah. now, maybe before. And what's happening is those unconscious processors, you know, one is saying, how do you solve the problem? Another one is doing this. And a lot of this work is happening unconsciously. You know, his brain is being like this um, AGI, you know, yeah. 
not yeah. an artificial an energy, a natural energy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Right. And and that's why we're saying this global broadcast system is a we think is a very good model for AGI. Mm. And if you think about it, it's not too unexpected because um, I was giving a talk on this in, in Beijing a few years ago and on um, our model. It wasn't as refined then, but uh, one of my colleagues actually from Carnegie Mellon was sitting in the audience, Raj Reddy. And he came up to me afterwards and he said, well, Lenore, that sounds like the Blackboard model for cognition that we were mm. thinking about in the 60s at Carnegie Mellon. Wow. And then I went back and looked at Bars, and he said his, ma, his influence on the global workspace came from these people at Carnegie Mellon who were doing cognition. It was Newell, Simon, mm. Raj Reddy. So it's not unusual or unexpected that this model that then was we're, we're taking over for consciousness goes back to its origins yeah. of intelligence. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's not like the unreasonable mathematics It's the reasonable mathematics. It's the reasonableness yeah. that, that this is happening. If that's true yeah. a little bit. Wow. But that's really that, cool. I want to get back to the feeling of consciousness because yeah. that's the thing I think we're, um mostly where the debate is for everybody right yeah mm -hmm. okay so i'm focusing on what i call the feeling of consciousness the feeling of free will the feeling of all oh, this okay so we have this model of the world processors and what this model is what this processor is doing, it's making models as it's getting more and more information of what's in the outside world, what's in the inside world. And it's starting to label things. It's not a perfect uh, picture. It, it, it's starting to label things with very succinct gist in brain okay. issue. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's labeling. And, you know, you can see these pictures of little babies who are still looking at their leg and starting to see that they can actually cause that leg to move. And so in its model of its world is saying that leg is part of self. Yeah. And that even though the baby would like to look at the light up there and turn it on by the power of its thought, it won't happen. So yeah. that light upstairs, up there on my ceiling is not self. So the baby is starting to make saying what self, not self, labeling these things, labeling different parts of its body as self, not self, different things as self, not self. And also as this, these models are getting more and, and it's getting feedback. So in these models, they're doing some planning. The planning is, let's say, if I kick this ball, will it uh, go to the other side of the room? And so it plans that it does get the actuator, it gets the motor, processor to actuate the, the, the leg to kick the ball and sees if that's going to go the other side of the room. And it starts <laughs> making these models of how of the physics of the world or whatever. Uh -huh. there. And after a while, as it's growing up, it's sort of starting to think, well, you know, I have control of things. I'm conscious. And it's starting to label its model of itself in the model of the world as conscious. Okay. Yeah. And after a while, and that's what we're seeing as the feeling of consciousness. Now, if you look at the CTM, there's no place, all of these processors are just, uh, you know, computers. They're not, they're not uh, conscious. They're just uh, machines, right? They're, the whole uh, entity is a machine. Everything's a machine. But the model, but the machine is looking at its model of the world. And in its model of the world, it's making some decisions about what it thinks about itself. And mm. it thinks itself is conscious. And so from the outside world and everybody else, it's sort of saying, yeah, I'm conscious. I see I'm conscious. And I think that if um, some of these large language models are developing models of worlds this way, they will start to have feelings. They will mm. start to be what we see as conscious. And I think it's a view very similar to Michael Graziano's attention schema theory. Um, I think it's a little bit, I'm starting to like um, Lisa Feldman Barrett's uh, constructed uh, emotions. So fitting mm. in 
I'm starting to, but very close to Graziano here in his yeah. attention schema. Very, very close. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, so um, an important point that you noted was that there's no director in your, in the yes. CTM model. Um, but it seems like it, talking about feelings, talking about qualitative feel, it feels like we're uh, phenomenally unified that I have a, you know, a phenomenally unified qualitative experience. And then there's this related problem in neuroscience about the, the, the binding problem. It seems like taking out a director might like exacerbate that where it's like the, the, the consciousness is like distributed across the, um, yeah, and it's bounded by that distrib distribution, and it's all together. So, in fact, um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Crick and Cock, you know, have this sort of identified the claustrum as mm -hmm. they call the director. We call that the global workspace. Okay, <laughs> you see, it's the global workspace. The claustrum is this um, subcortical, but it's very thin piece of brain that's connect highly, highly connected. Okay. It's multimodal. It, it combines feel, touch, sound, uh, vision, um, sensation, very multimodal, very interconnected, very thin, okay. very interconnected. And it's acting like a global workspace. Okay. They call it director. We don't. We call it the global workspace. Yeah. And that's what we see as the, as the unification there. It okay. doesn't have to be one thing. Uh, and in fact, that would be very bad if you have a director, because the director doesn't really know. See, what's, what I'm saying is the director doesn't know where the information is. You don't know. Yeah, because it's, because the information is distributed across all the it's processors. Distributed, and yeah. how you, it doesn't know. I think that would be a weaker form. Interesting. Uh, that's in my own view. So, uh, so yeah, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. That'd be like, you'd be, it'd be like making a mini global workspace within the global workspace, and that's not, that's not ideal. Um, you said earlier, the, the brain constructs consciousness. I wonder, is the conscious experience of being unified, is that like an emergent property of the global, of the CMT or sorry, CTM, CTM? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it, yeah. is it, cause we're talking a lot about hardware type stuff, I think, um, and, and well, I think seems, it's the, it's yeah. the model of the world that is giving you a uniform you know, and this model of the world, it's not like, you know, this models of the world, world models are, can be made in terms of or lots of the processors as well. They need to uh -huh. move. Um, so we have, you know, what I call um, predictive dynamics is, is working a lot here, you know, where we have these cycles of prediction, feedback, mm -hmm. learning, and this is really f informing our model of the world these little, uh, very succinct, brainish uh, gists, which are describing things, or have a lot of information. And in fact, you know, you can think about dreams. Uh, hmm. uh, so everybody says, you know, we're conscious when we're dreaming. That's a, an aspect, and it is. It, but how come in your dream, you are actually having these f pictures like of the outside world, and your eyes are closed? Yeah, it's because you have those the same things are happening. You have chunks of information which are multimodal gists, which have multimodal gists in them. They have the, but they're sketches. They're they're not the whole picture. You're filling in a lot, but they're sketches of things. Okay. And the only difference between uh, the really main difference between dreaming sleep, sleep and awakeness is that you're not getting input generally from the outside world. You're not actuating the outside world generally, mm -hmm. so that you can do some fantastical things in dreams, like you can fly in that, because there's nothing, no feedback coming in saying you can't uh, do right. it. Right. Yeah. But yeah. most of your dreams are pretty realistic. And how can that be? It's because these you have these brainish gist chunks going back at the short-term memory, creating the dream. And these are they're succinct. They have a lot of information, though they're very small. And, and in fact, this is where a little bit of um, theoretical computer science is coming in. These gists have to be small because the computation, if they're too large, the computation time to go from the long-term memory processes to short-term memory would be too long if you have too much information. That has yeah. to be pretty quick. And yeah. in our model, too, there's a lag between going from the unconscious processes up to short-term memory and then immediately broadcast. So, you know, that everybody's, 
you know, there's this literature that says like there's 300 millisecond gap between your unconscious making a decision and your being conscious of it. Well, there's a gap, a little gap like that in our machine as well. Okay. As, no, as soon as it gets in there, it gets broadcast immediately. But yeah, a little gap. Yeah. There's a time gap. So there are features. Um, I also want to say that we're not saying that this is the only very simple model. So we're looking for what what's often called one one year. Uh, Vanya Weiss calls the minimal models, and he points to ours as a minimal model. Um, we're not claiming that this is the only one. And in fact, if you go back to the Turing machine, one of the reasons the Turing machine became so central was it was the first, but there were many, many, many other models of computation after that that looked nothing like a Turing machine. There's, uh, you know, lambda calculus, there's uh, recursive functions. It is yeah. a very there are many, many, but the point was that they all had the same um, computable functions, defined the same functions. So we're not saying that the Turing machine isn't the only model that you could use that's very simple. Yeah. We're not saying this is necessarily the only model, but it is yeah. a model, and it's one we can understand, we're working with, that we are trying to develop and see what it can explain and not. And, we just did a short course uh, to an undergraduate at Peking University, and we set to them the problem of what this machine can and can't do, and what are other things. And they they came back with so many interesting examples of delusions. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> delusions and delusions, and and uh, other kinds of uh, you know psychological imperities uh, you know, and perfections that the machine could exhibit. And yeah. explanation. So that it became very interesting how, uh, so these young students who were very smart got very excited about seeing how they could break the model. And they, well, the main thing we had to do with them is that they would always try to make the model a little bit more complicated. Hmm. And we would show them how, you know, you don't need that extra thing. And oh, they, yeah. they sort of got it that we're trying to simplify. Right. Um, I, I, uh, one one thing that I was wondering about was um, at uh, Mindfest 2023, yeah. which was the you know the opening of the Center of uh, the Future Mind. Uh, s this one lady there was very much interested in hypnosis, and she kind of freaked me out actually. If she's listening, it's really weird. Um, but she she one of uh, the things that she wanted to maintain or ask about uh, was could a machine be hypnotized, and I wonder if that is predictable or if that uh, is explicable on your model could could a conscious turing machine be hypnotized do you think i would say probably my husband was it he went to a military school for high mm. school okay. and he told me that he had the biggest most fun because he could hypnotize everybody there mm. <laughs> he can when he went to mit he couldn't hypnotize anybody <laughs> huh. Military school, he could hypnotize almost everybody. Is that uh, because the rigid training that they that they do, the, the regimentation? Yeah, possibly, right? Wow, I think that's really interesting. No, so um, I we've not thought about that too much, uh, and that's a really good question. I don't want to say offhand. Sure, I, sure. I but but I'm, I think he has. In fact, I will after this ask him what he thinks of it. Awesome. We've looked at what well, people who do meditation. And what's happening with meditation okay um, and you know people have different things Our meditation is that giving you more consciousness or less consciousness hmm. you know when you get rid of everything are you more conscious it's, it's interesting how, how yeah. this, and so we do have a part of how this machine might meditate and i think okay. maybe hypnosis comes in a little bit there but okay. we, we haven't developed that enough for me to talk yeah about. but that's well, i think good, you're I, I think well, what's her name? Happy. Do you remember her name? I don't. Yeah, I don't remember. I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Um, Susan might know, but I, I think your your husband would be glad we we returned to dreams. Uh, so even though you tried to you know just disabuse <laughs> him of that earlier on, we got back to dreams. <laughs> right. Um, Thanks for pointing that out. I, yeah. I the connection. <laughs> so good, Lenore. I got I got just two more for you that I know my audience will be uh, they'll be really mad at me if I don't ask. But um, so this is a this has been influenced by. Uh, Turing machines, and I wonder, have do you also inherit some of the critiques of uh, machine functionalism, like the Chinese 
room or Ned Block's Chinese Nation, where it looks like you're attributing consciousness to things that aren't actually conscious. Uh, have you okay, guys dealt so with I that? Yeah, thought about that a little bit because you had. Okay. Yeah. So those are old. I mean, those are old. You know, there's old hat questions. Sure. Right? Sure. Um, okay. So first of all, I want to say with the Chinese room. I couldn't imagine anybody that passing the Turing test for the following reason. I mean, John Cyril would have had to take a lot of time to, so the, the question or the, some comment comes in in Chinese, he's acting like a computer, you know, doing going through mm -hmm. rigmarole, outputting yeah. something. But it's taking him a very long time and Nobody, they're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for this output, and it's not coming for a long time. This isn't passing the Turing test in any way, hmm. I would say, first of all. So that's a critique to begin with. Sure. Uh, second thing is, okay, how about putting GPT in the room? Right. And these, this is very interesting. There was a, a very nice article in New York Times a few weeks ago on what they call baby GPT, this person had taken, uh, you know, put on their laptop the program and gave it a, a, some, you know, sentence and then asked it to figure out next sentence or whatever. And you could see actually how it's just starting with gibberish, just total randomness, total randomness. And it's using this um, kind of uh, predictive analysis to predict the next word, to look at for patterns that these uh, these generative models are doing. And after a while, it's getting some words and all of that. And my claim is you put that into the Chinese room, and after a while, it's going to start to learn languages because this machine is learning a language. Yeah. It may not learn it the way you learn it, but it's learning a language. And it's coming out with great sonnets and it's coming out with very quickly. It's coming yeah. out with great poetry, a poetry at that least, as somebody said, uh, you know, it's good, good enough that you know that Donald Trump didn't write it. Uh -huh. um, so the point is that uh, this machine is actually learning language. And I'm putting that in. It may not be learning it your way, but it certainly is learning language. Do you, do you think it, under, it understands like the what semantic? Do you, what do you mean by understand? Yeah, uh, right. What do you mean by that? And I, you know, after a while, it will start to understand because it will start making models of the world mm. and it will start doing these other things. And, uh, okay. And, um, so I would say, yeah, take John Searle out and put a GPT in, maybe GPT 5 or 6 or 7 inside, yeah. and then you see how it's really. He, so John Searle says he doesn't speak, uh, uh, doesn't speak Chinese. Right. Right. Well, this machine speaks Chinese, will speak Chinese, I, I claim. Okay. Will speak, even though he, so I'm saying that John Searle would actually, if he's smart enough, would actually learn Chinese after a while with lots more examples and lots more questions. He would be actually getting a bigger data set, lots of input, lots of output, making these connections, doing a deep learning type of thing. Mm -hmm. He would learn Chinese. Okay. And he would see the connections of things and things would come out, you know, the input, the output would be related. And that's how we learn language, really. Mm. At a, so often I was thinking, actually, when you ask, often ask younger, you know, like teenagers, how they learn another language, you know, they've gone to another country, they come to America and they learn English. They'd often say by watching television. Now, yeah, nobody's, yeah, I've heard that too. Grammar, nobody's teaching them grammar. They're just getting input output types of things they're putting connections in they're seeing things over and over again in a certain context um but they're seeing like a i think this is where like like donald davidson stuff kind of might come in where there's like a triangulation going on where they, they're associating a word or a phrase or you know a sound with uh something in the external world and they can ask someone else does that mean this, right? Well, that, after a while, these machines will be doing that as well. I mean, right okay. now, they're doing amazing things with just having a huge data set, kind yeah. of training data and all of Especially that. Especially with a human in the loop. Yeah, yeah. They they're can not even human. They, I mean, they can, yeah, ask other machines. They can ask. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> whatever, that's, that's whatever fascinating. They do. So yeah. I'm saying that I think he did not anticipate, I think that he did not realize. And I think the power of this compu fast computation is amazing. And I think these machines are learning how to speak Chinese. I mean, yeah. let's take that room. Then yeah. the other one, I think there was another question. Yeah, that the, the Chinese nation. Uh, 
Yeah, which and I think is that the model is you have everybody. The reason, the reason they're using China is because lots of, lots of people, and each person would be like a, um, a neuron and connected right. at the very least. Well, if you look at beehives, this is very much the beehive itself is uh, becoming consciously aware, and they're doing things very, you know, the bees themselves have these intricate ways of communicating dances. There, there's a bubble dance, yeah, the mind, the mind, yeah, all of that giving. So, first of all, the mind of the bee is fantastic, and then the mm. hive itself is going to have a mind as well. I mean, look at. So that's my answer to the Chinese nation. I think we've already seen, if we understand the beehive better, we already see something like that, the beehive being a, a, mod, uh, a mind. Okay. So I think there are, um, that's what I would say. For me, it's not, there are explanations to this. Of course, when things seem mysterious, they think seem impossible. Sure. Yeah. Just because we don't know doesn't mean it's not. Right, yeah. But I, I think getting a more science into these areas uh, sort of helps a lot. Sure. Um, yeah. Anyway, so. Well, Lenore, uh, la last one for you. I, I, I have to ask because because you, you know mathematics and stuff. A lot of my audience just kind of assumes that uh, the Lucas Penrose use of, of Gödel's incompleteness just totally eradicates the possibility of AI or AGI or computational theories of mind. Um, can you interact with that? Can you can you tell us like why why doesn't uh, the incompleteness arguments why don't they refute uh, AI? Um, right. Uh, so when Penrose's book, um, I can't remember. It's like the Emperor has no clothes. Emperor's new Emperor's new mind. Yeah, Emperor's you got two of them. Mind. Yep. Right. I love the book for the following. Because I know it was a critique of connections computing at that time. That was the, the AI of the, of the time. Yeah. But what he did in that book, which was really nice, he gave all his most, all of these very interesting areas of mathematics and physics, things he loved and explained them in pretty, in very nice ways. So if yeah. you read the book, just that, to get that kind of information about mathematics and physics, it's great. Totally. Yeah. Um, but he asked a question there. Um, about the Mandelbrot set. Hmm. So he says that here we have, I don't know if you, uh, your f readers are probably familiar with these uh, fractal things in the Mandelbrot set, which uh -huh. has a very specific um, definition. And uh, he says, well, is the Mandelbrot decidable or not, or what is it? And, you know, how can you frame this in uh, the Turing thing? And for example, it's done on the complex plane, which is the our, our real number R2 that's drawn. Um, and that's not discrete, it's continuous. Okay. So it doesn't fit quite into the Turing theory. And then in those years, I was developing with my colleagues, uh, Mike Schub and Steve Smale, a much more general model of computation than Turing. It was sort of analogous. It was, we were saying that as mathematicians or as uh, numerical analysts, we, we're always viewing the real numbers as basic. Okay. And we don't want to chop it up into approximations or anything. We want to just, when you're in high school and you're given a quadratic equation, you know, AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero, and you're asked to solve it, the teacher doesn't say A and B and C are real numbers. Uh, you're taking the square root of b squared minus square root of c, or whatever the, the formula is. They're all real numbers you're dealing with. The teacher doesn't say, just assume they're integers or bits or whatever. So you're dealing with real numbers all the time. So we developed a theory of computation over the real numbers, okay, where, um, which actually it's over any field. And we get a lot of general results over that and where we can actually ask and answer the question about the Mandelbrot set. Huh. So we get the answer about the Mandelbrot set. It's, um, it's semi-decidable, but not decidable. Semi-decidable. <laughs> so anyway, he in his next edition of uh, that book, 
paperback yeah. edition. He has a footnote to me saying that I'd written him a letter saying, wow. that, saying maybe this model is the one that will explain it. Well, we never did. I, I'm not saying our model did, but I just sure. was telling him that there are other models that you can have where you can actually ask and answer these questions. Very cool. So I'm sort of diverting, not getting into this thing. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, how can I say it? Um, any system, his system, whatever, it's always going to have this property that within the system, um, you know, if it's consistent, there will be statements that are true but not provable from the system if it has this, and that's going to happen. Yeah. On the other Good hand, on, on the other hand, as I mentioned at the beginning, this course, I, mathematical logic I took with um, Hilary Putnam was, it looks like it was defying Gödel's uh, in inconsistency theorem on inconsistency because it's proving the consistency of piano arithmetic and using sort of what's called transcendent induction, but it's outside the system. So there are things one can do. I don't think that uh, my point is that he's using uh, an argument that just doesn't, for me, add up. Yeah. And even more, it doesn't add up because in the world and what we can do, things are limited by resources. Okay. And there are time constraints going on that we have to, we can't do certain things because of time constraints. We can't do, uh, things can't happen. There are limited resources aren't taken into account. And yeah. those are whole other arguments that I would so put in, but I'd have to sit down and think about this. <laughs> yeah. You were totally cogent. But yeah. that was the one. Well, I've, I've actually met Penrose because he's come to Pittsburgh a number of times. But that's my one super connection with him is by showing him that in a different model, you can prove that the value put set is, you know, semi decidable. But not yeah, that's so cool. Uh, Some, someone, I, I had a, a philosopher of uh, mathematics on. Uh, um, Mark Colvin, and and he he had mentioned that perhaps we don't know our own you know, girdle sentence or whatever. Yeah, you know, we can look at other other systems and see that they have a girdle sentence that's not provable. But it's not like we know our full like computational uh, model that our that our mind is if it is such a thing. So it's not like we have. Uh, it's not like you can point to our girdle sentence and say, "Look, we understand this," even though we can't prove it. So I, I wonder if if that's another uh, another cogent answer against the Lucas Penrose thing, but yeah, again, that, that probably took us. I think consciousness is uh, simpler. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> More interesting. Yeah. yeah. And again, I mean, Penrose has his own thing on consciousness too. Right. Yeah. Microtubules. And... A little bit right, different yeah. as well. So totally. I think those are areas where we don't quite see eye to eye. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Lenore, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for for laying out your your whole system here, your whole project with your husband and and your son. Like this has been really really cool, and I I know my audience is gonna love it. We've been talking a lot about global workspace on uh, the the episodes lately, so luckily like we're, it, it fits right into this conversation. So folks, if if you were lost a little bit here, go back and check out the last couple episodes. Um, it's really really fun stuff and like cutting edge stuff. So Lenore, thanks so much for all your time, and thanks for um, for telling these AI theorists that they need to study consciousness. Um, yeah. uh, I, I heartily agree. And uh, likewise for uh, philosophers of religion, like we need to keep, yeah. keep going on this stuff. Yeah. Go to the AMCS website and you can see our letter if you want to sign it. Yep. I'll put that link in the description. So folks, wherever yeah. you're getting this podcast at, go check that out. Um, right. Lenore, is there any place that you would like to point people to, uh, who want to learn more from you? From me? Well, we have, um, a paper that I think is a pretty nice one that came out last year in the uh, PNAS, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, we have a viewpoint paper, which is a little shorter on archive. We're writing a, a monograph now, the three of us together, oh, cool. should be awesome. out in the year, um, right, which is going to go into details here and we'll have, could use it in a short course, of course, we have we've been trying it out with both at Carnegie Mellon students and in Peking students, Peking hmm. students. Um, awesome. We had fun with that. Great. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll link 
whatever I can in the, in the, uh, in the show notes here, folks. So go and check out more from the Blums. It's, it's uh, really exciting stuff. Yeah. All right. It's well, that's going to, it's a family business. <laughs> that's right. That's awesome. <laughs> so good. What a, what a, yeah. what a wild business. Uh, folks, that's going to have to do it for now. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. Yeah.